This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven, and my friend and colleague, Arthur Parkinson, who is with us today, which is incredibly nice. Hello, Arthur. Hello, Sarah. How are you doing? Well, thank you. Good. And um, excited for this episode because I'm looking at the most gorgeous cover of the autumn catalogue inspired by Perch Hill in very bold letters, which is very, very thrilling. Oh, good. Yes. So we thought today we would talk about our favourite things from our autumn range, which obviously is coming up. We're in the thick of it now, really autumn. And gosh, wasn't spring a struggle? Well, spring and summer, to be honest, it just rained and rained and rained and the light levels were rubbish and the slugs were horrendous and it just felt a struggle. Now, actually, the garden at Perch Hill is rather ebullient and it's really odd. I don't know if you found this, Arthur, but things like sweet peas have got stems twice as long. Lilies yeah. are twice as tall. And I guess there are certain plants that really thrive in the wet, but others that have sort of struggled and aren't nearly as flowery and are very late like dahlias. Have you had that experience too? Yeah, I mean, um, it's really funny with the sweet peas, isn't it? Because they, they struggled and yeah. our friend Caroline was growing tons of sweet peas. And I remember visiting her in... I think it was May and she was like having a breakdown over all these sweet peas that yeah. just weren't growing and were moth eaten by slugs and snails and then literally two weeks later <gasps> they just broke out into growth and Caroline has been really annoying me with endless sweet pea photos <laughs> <laughs> you know like Medusa vases of sweet peas <laughs> and yeah so yeah winners and losers but with with climate chaos as I'm now calling it rather than climate change we've just got to get used to it and I think be grateful for whatever thrives yeah really And just to finish on sweet peas, I mean, the the thing that I suppose we all need to learn from it is that just because they're not growing well above ground, it doesn't mean, of course, that their roots aren't Mm. growing incredibly well below ground because actually they're cold climate plants. Lots of states in America that friends of mine live in, you can't grow sweet peas because it's just too hot and the soil's too hot and they hate that. So they've actually thrived and their roots have done so well and that's why you've got the stem length. Anyway, let's draw a line under spring and summer and move on to the autumn season, which so far has been rather lovely, and concentrate on the things that we can plant now that will make our gardens just really our havens and our palettes and our paintings and our gyms and our mental health well-being sanctuaries for next spring. So Arthur, what what's your sort of first pick of what you're definitely going to be going for to plant this season for next season? Well, well for this nostalgia really because I love seeing the tulip pages of the catalog because it's always interesting what you manage to to find back that's kind of been discontinued in previous seasons and I remember my first year working at the Emma Bridgewater factory. I'd done these very large raised beds and the tulip I chose to plant in them was a tulip called Queen's Day. Mm. And um, I absolutely loved it because it was a a big peony-sized tulip, but the most gorgeous deep blood orange Mm. colour. And I love its petals because they all are like turned into the centre of the flower, almost like an octopus Mm. in its tentacles all around the body of the octopus. So... um, I'm really, really, really nice to see that that tulip again because I, I thought we'd lost it and you've obviously found someone who's growing it again. Yeah. So that's very nice. And do you know why I, I put it back in the autumn range? Because um, it's still coming up here. I mean, I can't remember when you were at Bridgewater, but when I first planted Queen's Day in amongst mm. the um, shuttlecock ferns, Struthioptris, it takes dapple shade and it's in done under the black bamboo and it still comes up every year. And so... I think we sort of turned away from it because our customers turned away from such bright, strong colours wanting more pastels. But to be honest, you have to rate a variety if it's a cracker and a high performer and incredibly perennial. And Queen's Day is one of the most perennial tulips we've ever grown in the garden here. 
And it still comes up, this sort of statuesque, it reaches my knee, honestly. It's extraordinary. Uh, sort of, some of them have gone to being more single, some are still very double, but with this lovely sort of curvy, as you say, sort of inflex petal, and this really amazing kind of tomato soup, blood orange, um, but not, not a coarse red or orange, a really beautiful, subtle, well, is orange ever subtle? But it's as subtle as orange gets. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I love it too. I love it too. And actually... That leads me into my number one, my first selection. Not necessarily my number one, because I think these are all pretty much equal pegging for both of us. But I am more and more addicted to perfume and fragrance as the older I get. It's more and more important to me, as well as color. And so for me, I'm putting in loads of scented tulips again this autumn. And we've been experimenting with lots over the years. And of course, number one scented tulip is ballerina. But also I love brown sugar for being early. And I always think it's got the same sort of scent in the same kind of family, which is the kind of freesia scent family of ballerina. But it's got a pinch of garam masala. And I rather like that sort of curry overtone or undertone, whatever. And I also love request, which is the color of red brick. And that's also scented. And, you know, there are just, there are sort of more and more coming on the market but so I put the scented tulip collection together with four varieties all really scented and uh, including those and yeah I'm just really looking forward to them and tulip of sylvestris is another one the yellow wild tulip which has got a very gentle scent but that's a that's another cracker so that would be my first selection from our range and what's your second Arthur? Yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on the the perfume side of buying because I just love perfume more and more actually and you're so right it's a very nurturing thing even when you're asleep going to sleep or waking up to have something by the bed that smell even if you've had an awful day or having an awful time a proper natural scent of the natural world is so much nicer than all these horrible man-made sprays you now buy at vast expense so um, I'm planting lots of the bedside table narcissi collection um, and I love the photo of it, actually. It's a, it's a few years old now, this collection, so it proves that people have enjoyed planting it. And it, to me, looking at this photograph, it's almost like trying to evoke the style of when we're selecting dahlias because you've got a really lovely big narcissi in the middle, of that white and pink of... Um, or oh, what's the variety of that one? Is it New Story? New Story. Or My Story, yeah. My Story. Yeah, yeah. And it's wonderful in bud. I love how it's in bud. It's almost yeah. like that limey green... And then out come the white petals with that hint of quite peach melba pink. So I love that and I love that it's centred. And it's surrounded by all the classics, um, you know, particularly Actea and, and Pheasant Sai. And they're all, they're all just wonderful perennial bulbs to plant for picking. And I think pick them because, you know, the spring we've just had, I picked so many Narcissi for the house. And it was just joyful and nice to feel that you're not harming the bulb, you know, as long as you leave those bulbs on, you're not harming those bulbs at all, they'll come back. Absolutely. So I think Narcissi, uh, I mean, I never used to notice Narcissi yeah. and I don't remember. It's really funny when I think back to Discovering You in the Bold and Brilliant Garden book, I don't remember that being full of Narcissi, but I know now if you were to do another Bold and Brilliant Garden, it would be really packed with them because they're just such yeah. good forever world bulbs, aren't they? So They really yeah. are. I think they're the sustainable bulb of the future, really, because mm. they're so perennial. You don't have to do anything to them. They grow in sun or shade. They grow in a little bit of moisture or in dry, you know, chalky, sandy soil. They're, they're just so versatile. And they also have, as you said, this incredible perfume. So actually, that is one of my next selections is the Sensation series. And there are a couple, Starlight Sensation is a white and moonlight sensation is sort of harvest moon, slightly sort of yellowy. Both of them absolutely amazing. We had them in pots this spring and I came out of my door and they're on the wellhead in pots. So I walk past them every day. They flowered for weeks. I mean, honestly, five or six weeks, which is so unusual for a daff. They were unbelievably perfumed, multi-headed, so really good value because you get lots of um, flower heads at the top of a stem and from our planting in grass from two or three years ago also, they appear to be really good comer backers. So they're really, really perennial. So I'm just like you, I'm going to be going for as many narcissus as I am tulips this year. And of course, they're very healthy. I mean, with our wetter springs, we have to be aware of tulip blight. 
And we found we've got round that by actually planting them almost solely in pots because it just means that the spores have further to go and you get much less cross-contamination. Um, but narcissists, you just don't even need to think about that. They just don't seem to get pests or diseases. And the only problem is if you've got a rather over-enthusiastic mowing person, you don't want them to mow off the leaves too early because that makes them turn blind. But I think they're absolutely fantastic. And so they would definitely be one of my next selections. And if I can just add another quick one for planting in grass, I'm totally obsessed with the pheasant size. And I've actually created a collection called the Pheasant Sign Narcissus Collection, which has got three in and the reason it's got three is Actea comes first and is really quite early, flowers from March into April. And then there's another one, which is a pure white, and that's called Ice Wings, and that flowers next. And then you've got Recurvus, which actually flowers in May, where the petals are reflexed right back onto the stem. So that's why it's called Recurvus. All of them amazing perfume and all absolutely beautiful, delicate in a vase and delicate growing through grass or in a border, just crackers. Beautiful. That kind of leads us on to one of your choices, but I should mention it now on the subject of lawns, which is the Spice Up Your Grass collection. Oh, yes. That looks literally like something that you've collected off a, I don't know, one of these Cretan islands that you love visiting so much. It doesn't look English, but I know it is because it's got the most beautiful snake's head fertility in it. And I managed to go and see those in a water flower meadow, not too far from, from where I live, Crick, mm. Cricklade, I think it's called. Yes, that's right. Um, where the Thames floods and they love the, the wet soil there. And luckily no one's ploughed it. So I think it's one of the biggest fertility meadows in the country now, that one. Yeah. Um, but you can have a little bit of wildflower beauty in your lawn. And I just love the fact that the photo, I like the fact that there's the arrangement in this beautiful glass bowl on a stem. Yeah. And then there's the photo of it all growing in the lawn absolutely beautiful yeah it's down the drive that and um that's been coming back now that trio for four or five years which is why i put it in the range this autumn and i completely love it and actually i went to holland with the team this spring and the thing that we were in a way most blown away by were the species the botanical tulips and we visited a breeder who had these whole fields of and ones like peppermint stick and, you know, those Clusiana ones. And they're just so delicate and yet so showy. And I'd, I, I'd never sort of quite taken them seriously before. But the reason we visited him is, again, of course, they're unbelievably healthy. They're unbelievably perennial. They grow really happily in grass or a border. And so they're very versatile. So, you know, increasingly, I think um, they're going to be on the up. And they're actually being hybridized now to make them a bit showier but they're still only much more petite scale than the main garden hybrids. But yeah, I'm I'm really obsessed by those this year. And we're putting in tons down the drive here, tons more um, to add to what we've got already. So what about alliums, Arthur? Are you going for any alliums? Um, more Scobertii, because I love that one yeah. for Christmas. I love the first days of Summer Ball collection and the caption you've written is so on point. Uh, that time before the roses get going and the tulips have all gone over if you've gone in for tulips. Mm. Um, I do think, you know, the the allium brassiness is so beautiful. and I love how you've merged it with the steeper gigantia stems mm. in that, that arrangement. And That's also good. Dutch iris. And I know we've spoken about Dutch iris and people just don't buy Dutch irises, so we, we don't carry many of those, do we? No. But I think, I think again, you know, I, I do think with the changing climate, they are... Very, very beautiful and very perennial. I've got Dutch iris in my grandma Sheila's garden and I must have planted those getting on for 15 years ago and they still just come back. They just reappear and they're the most wonderful, like little birds of paradise on a stem. They just suddenly open out these buds. So consider Dutch iris that are in this collection. I think it's, um, is it burning embers or something yeah, like that? Is, variety? Yeah, yeah, red embers, I think it's called, yeah. Red embers. Yeah, yeah, I love it too. So my allium, I just wanted to mention, there's a new Schubertii called Arctic Snow, which is a white one, and it is pricey. And that sort of sometimes puts me off and puts lots of other people off. But what we found, we didn't put it in the catalogue, in the range, until we trialled it. And just like Schubertii, uh, the mauve one, which has been coming back in the garden now, even in a bed that floods, amazingly, for 15, 20 years, 
So, I mean, Arctic snow hasn't been around very long, but it's certainly come back for two or three seasons at least and shows signs of being exactly the same. And that's the thing I think people perhaps don't realise about alliums is that put them in once and you'll be looking at, at them in 20 or 30 years. And that makes such a difference. And for me, allium magic is my new must have. So it, it's actually not in the catalogue range, but on web only. And I just love its sort of slightly crazy, twisty, turny stem. And I don't know if you remember seeing alliums in some of the Chelsea gardens this spring, this May. In Anne Marie's, there was one called Forelock, and it almost bends double, so it grows up like a leek, and then the stem just curves and curves and curves, and it looks like this sort of meandering river on the stem. Anyway, magic does a bit of that, and I love that, but it's also the showiest of the ones with the curvy stems because it's got a flower head almost the size of Christophii, but with this wonderful curving elegance. So... Ally Magic is a real cracker, really good for seed heads, and yeah, just just love it. And then any other bulbs, Arthur, that you're going for? Crocuses, yeah, more and more each year, mainly because they are like the Narcissi and the Alliums, more perennial. And for me, I can lift them out of my pots when they've done the thing, shove them in a pot in the shed, and they all get forgotten about. And unlike all the other bulbs that I do that to find them again and they're just happy to go back in as long as I've left the leaves on to shrivel up and up they come again and um, you know the the bumblebee queens we, we just don't know what the weather's going to do so we have to make sure our gardens are full of flowers I think earlier and earlier because you know thinking back to I think it was early February wasn't it the weather was just like mid-April and that meant all the pollinators just woke up and they need as much food as, as they can find so I just think crocuses are wonderful and we've got orange monarch which is more expensive than the others and smaller, but it is honestly just the most gorgeous Pirates of the Caribbean Aztec gold orange. It's the, for me, it's the first smack of orange that I really need when the sky is grey and, you know, winter feeling of badness is at its worst. So I love that one. I also love Spring Beauty. And I've got that in coal buckets that have got Budlia, dwarf Budlias in. And these Spring Beauty bulbs, they must be getting on for 10 years now. And they just come back and they look lovely underneath the silver of the buddleia foliage just as it starts to pop yeah so i love that one yeah um, great yeah. great so i suppose because of the damp spring and early summer lilies have been particularly good as i mentioned um at the beginning and i've just been blown away by lilies this year and i think it is the combination of two things that with a wetter climate, lilies are going to do better because, of course, naturally where they grow, um, often in the Himalayas, they've got high humidity. It's hot, but it's also very, uh, there's a lot of moisture and a lot of rain and high humidity in the atmosphere. And so they've really thrived this year. But also, I don't know about you and all our listeners, but we've definitely found lily beetle to be less, less, less of a problem. It's still there and we do still have to squash some, a few lilies. When I walk around on my 5.30 a.m., walk I often attend to a few lily beetles but it's honestly they're just they're really decreasing and so lilies of course I think should be returning to fashion again and I've completely adored three I mean I I've always loved lilium specios and rubrum and there's a variety called black beauty uh, which is so elegant and last two weeks in a vase and similarly the other turks cat one that I adore is called lilium henryi and that's a species. And that's been coming up in the rose garden here now for 10, 12 years, I'd say. Uh, but this year in the Oast Garden, without doubt, the glamour queen for June and July was Claude Schreider. And it's this beautiful burgundy terracotta colour. Flowers for ages has completely naturalised. So it's forming these big drifts. Now, uh, I think I initially put in five bulbs and there must be more like 25 I don't know, but five to seven years later. So it's really well established. It doesn't have a particularly powerful fragrance. It's there, but it's not like the Casablanca or the sort of cut flower lilies, but it's so much more discreet, delicate, and yet uh, glamorous. It's like a really well-dressed, do you know what? It's like one of your idols, Debo Devonshire, beautifully <laughs> dressed, incredibly mm. elegant, very petite and graceful. But it's not petite in a in a short way. It's very tall, but it's just got this absolutely 
incredible delicacy to it. So yeah, crazy about crazy about lilies again. Yeah, and they're fantastic for pots. I mean, I've got a collection I bought from you in a pot. Again, it's been in there for several years, and the foliage actually looks gorgeous. I've got it standing on something, so it's at the same level of quite a tall pot that a fig's growing in. And so the foliage of these Turks cap lilies goes through the fig, arching through. And now I've got the lovely leaves of the fig, and out are coming the lilies, and it looks just like a Rousseau painting. And you're completely right about the lily beetle. I was in Ireland at the weekend uh, doing a talk, and I visited um, a garden called Hunting Brook, and he'd got thickets of lilies. Th- these lilies were like giraffes, and the leaves looked like they were out of a florist shop. There was no lily beetle at all. And I said, don't you worry about lily beetle? He says, we don't, we're not getting it like we used to. So I don't know what's happening. Maybe something awful is eating the lily beetle that we don't know about yet. But yeah, they, they certainly seem to be down in, in number, which is which is great. Do you know, it's funny, actually, as you say that, um, I've just come back from our annual holiday on the west coast of Scotland. Mm. And it was transformed because there were almost no midges. So the west coast of Scotland is famous for, you know, on a sort of, low light level, dank evening or early morning, you can't go out without being covered in this stuff called smidge, which is, I don't know, it's, it's anyway, it's by far the best of all the um, sort of mozzy mid repellents. But you, you didn't need it. We had all the doors and windows open. And even when the weather wasn't good, there were no midges. Anyway, that was slightly worrying. But uh, as you say, with the lily beetle, it's slightly worrying. But also... <laughs> rather to be celebrated. So let's remember that a tiny bit. Anyway, what about your next choice, Arthur? Well, this is sort of a dreamy choice because I'm not sure if I'll have access to a a greenhouse to grow them, but maybe you'll tell me I don't need a greenhouse. I'm so delighted to see a punchy, gorgeous, crazy ranunculus collection that you've put together, I think, of two amber and crimson varieties that look so beautiful, just like beautiful silk, Mm. lovely buttercup-like faces. Avi Picotti Caff, I think, is one, and Elegance Viola is the burgundy one. Yes. But yeah, if you've been waiting for ranunculuses to finally break out of the pastel palette, yes. um, I think you've cracked it with this this collection. Yeah, <laughs> it is It is amazing, those. I do love them. So, tip for growing, what I'd say, what we've done well with, with these, like the anemone coronarius, the huge florist anemones, the big saucer ones, they originate from warmer climates originally. So I've seen the Asiatic ranunculus um, growing wild in Crete beside the roads, as I have the anemones. The anemones naturally flower in February and March, whereas the ranunculus actually naturally flowers in, in April or even into May. So they will be later. But what I have found, if you don't have a greenhouse, if you do have a greenhouse or a polytunnel or a coal frame, I would maybe grow them there. But like Arthur, if you don't, you can still grow them. And what I would do is put them in pots But what I would do is if a cold snap is forecast or a really wet snap is forecast, I would just bring them in to the house out of the weather. So literally, I know that sounds high maintenance, but how many times do you have frost forecasts? Well, here this last winter, two or three. So that's only two or three nights you've got to attend to them. And yes, it's wet, but if they're an incredibly freely drained, so at least a third grit in their mix, And you need to remember, if they're in a pot, just wrap some stuff to protect um, the outer layer, almost like a mulch, but you can't obviously do a mulch around a pot, but like a mulch in the garden. So wrap bubble wrap or some straw or some hessian or whatever, just to insulate them a little bit. And again, you only need to do that if it's super cold. But in that way, you recreate the sort of Mediterranean environment, which of course is really cold where I've seen lots of these things growing because they grow high and they may even be under snow for a bit, but they won't be for ages and it won't be super wet. So you've just got to be aware, good drainage, really, really, really acute drainage and protect them against the coldest of the nights if they're ongoing, you know, several nights in a row. Lovely. Well, I'm definitely going to try and grow those then. Good. And we can revisit and see how they've done um, next spring. So I'd love to move on to perennials now and... So bulbs are obviously fantastic and biennials, maybe we'll come back to biennials, but autumn is a really, really good, safe, very sensible time to plant perennials because of course 
you don't need to water because the nature, the heavens do it for you right the way through until the roots have got well established when they come under the demand of flowering the following spring or perhaps summer or even late summer. And so I'm putting in lots more Achilles this autumn. And um, the reason is that they make wonderful cut flowers. They make wonderful dried flowers. And if you hang them upside down, they almost always keep their color, which is incredibly lovely. And dried flowers are the most sustainable way to supplement your garden flowers through the winter. So they're really useful for that. And I also think they make great container plants. And so there was one that we had on the doorstep outside my workroom called Flower Bust Red Shades. And, you know, I've taken it out of the pots. Well, actually, I lie. Josie's taken them out of the pots <laughs> and planted them into a border now in the farmhouse garden. And they have given me so much pleasure this summer and into the autumn. And they're still looking nice, even though we're in September now. And yeah, so Achilles for me, I want to trial more and, and grow more in general, um, just because they, they flower for ages, they dry brilliantly, um, and they make a fantastic cut flower. Yeah, they look so happy in those pots. Yeah. Um, I have to say, such healthy foliage. Yeah. They look beautiful. They've kind of got it all in a way, I think. Mm, Very easy to grow too. Very, very easy to grow. Perennials for you? I really like the look of another hellebore that you found, which looks beautiful. Atrorubens. Yes. um, Beautiful, dark, plummy colour. And I remember when we were doing our our spring tours, we just had endless hellebores because we did very early teaching this year. And if it wasn't for the hellebores, I don't know what we'd have done. Exactly. But um, they were absolutely incredible. And, you know, most of my hellebores I have to grow in pots, but they've, they've really loved the wet of, of this year. They yeah. look very happy in pots, even after they've finished flowering. Just deadhead them, take the stems right back to the heart of the plant and any old leaves, take off, and then just keep them moist through the winter. They're a lovely foliage plant for a really dark basement by the door type garden yeah so i really love them and you know they flower at a really crucial time for bumblebees as they wake up so very sustainable and long-lived perennials can't have enough of them do you want to give tips for conditioning the martha as a cut flower or shall i well we can do um yeah if you if you're cutting them the big thing is your thing now of going up the the stem with a knife isn't it very lightly so it's, is it scoring, submerging, searing? Yeah, or exactly. Searing, scoring, submerging. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter as, lo- as long as you do them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you need to score the stem, just like Arthur says, then plop them in a bath or a sink overnight, submerging them. And I do think it's also worth searing the stem end. So Arthur's exactly right. It's the three S's and it really, it really makes a difference. Basically, what I've concluded with the temperamental ones is that they're unbelievably temperature sensitive. So... If you can whack them outside the back door in the vase you've arranged them in or in a bucket or whatever, that's how we kept them going on our lecture tours. And we would just keep them really cool in the night hours. And then they could come into centrally heated sort of classrooms and lecture spaces in the daylight hours. But yeah, the three S's and then and then temperature. So I'm, I'm going to um, go for a climber as my next must have. And the reason is they have been unbelievably lovely in the garden here this summer and early autumn, and it's Trachylospermum jasminoides. And I know in a way it's almost, it's such a well-known plant, it's sort of almost embarrassing to mention it, but it's called jasminoides because it's like jasmine, the fragrance is like jasmine, but it's evergreen, so it's a fantastic plant. But do you know, I didn't know until this year that it was so tolerant of shade, so it will grow in full sun. You know, I've I've seen it all over walls in the Mediterranean and it will grow in dappled shade and even in quite profound shade where the foliage in winter then turns a sort of lovely reddy color, but it doesn't drop its leaves. And it's one of those plants that if I was to select 10 things for every single garden in Britain, Trachylospermum jasminoides would be one of them. Obviously, it's not 100% hardy, so I know those of you who live in very cold frost pockets will be screaming at me, saying, we can't grow it. Well, find it a very, very, very sheltered spot, not necessarily south-facing wall, because that may not be very sheltered, but a really sheltered spot, perhaps west-facing, uh, and try it. Or have it in a pot, and if you have somewhere to bring something in, you know, in a porch or something in the coldest nights again. But anyway, track a spermum. I've re-fallen back in love with it again. It's a fantastic plant. 
Yeah, it's nice walking through London and at this time of year and just smelling lots of it, isn't it, in the evening. It's def- very much a London plant for me. I, I associate it with London. Yeah. And what's your next? Well, next page is roses. And um, I hope you're really proud of the roses that you sell because I do bang on about them to people. Living in part of the world where David Austin, rightly, is an addiction for most gardeners because they, they do very beautiful roses, very healthy, but not the best roses for cutting because they are quite thin-stemmed, not cloudy for the vase and um, our roses I think really do tick all the boxes in health productivity and being good for cutting and in the garden but my favorite one that you've sold for a long time is Metabolis and I bought one actually on the sale day of this year's Chelsea Flower Show and somehow got it back on the train and it was flowering then and then I deadheaded it and it's literally not stopped flowering and it's in a pot my main advice is definitely line the pot that you've got your rose in with wool because they hate to dry out. Uh, yeah, the haughty world stuff is really good news, isn't it? Honestly, this this rose metabolis it's in a it's in a decent sized coal bucket, but not a massive not a massive pot. You know, I can lift it out, lift it off the table onto the table. But the wool has just kept it so lovely and moist all through the summer, and it's reflowering now. And the the flowers literally are like a, a pink butterfly when the wind catches the petals. They're just just like a someone's chucked wedding confetti. <laughs> over the middle of the garden and I, I just love it and I love the structure of it because it creates quite a dense structure it's not too thorny I think it's one of the nicest roses that you could buy yeah I, I completely agree it reminds me of my dad actually my dad always loved mutabilis and so that's how long it's been around I mean my dad died 40 years ago so it's sort of it's an amazing rose I, I completely agree so I'm going to finish with an edible actually and that's going to be my last choice uh, and I think you might have one too that you want to mention so I'm an absolute salad addict my children and their partners just laugh at me because I am a rabbit I'm a total rabbit and I never go a day without having salad something raw of some description at the mo- moment of course it's tomatoes but really often it's a leafy salad and I really passionately, passionately recommend for planting almost any time of year, but including autumn and winter, our handsome winter lettuce collection. And it's because it includes three totally cracker varieties for all times of year. The first one is ciabatta, which is not spelt like the bread. It's not C-I-A, it's C-E-R-B-I-A-T-T-A. And it is amazing. And do you know why? It's, it's so good because it has really crunchy stems, which for the oak leaf family, which it's part of, is quite unusual. They're normally quite floppy. But this has got really good crunchy stems and it's really sweet and it doesn't get that bitterness, which lettuces can when they're under stress in the summer. So I've been eating that literally just by the bucket load over the last few weeks and I'm about to plant my second load of seedlings to take me through the winter and then a cos freckles is crunchy and it's a lovely sort of slightly mahogany kind of bronzy leaf but with red flecks through it so it really brings a salad bowl to life and again crunchy delicious good stems really really lovely and then the other one that we've trialed recently is rouge diva which is um Rouge d'hiver, rather, I've got a terrible French accent, which is red of winter. And another one called outrageous, terrible name. But um, that's a sort of Batavia type, so a sort of open, kind of, you know, crunchy, but not of the cos variety, if you sort of mean. Anyway, between those four, wow, you've got a fantastic bowl of salad. So I couldn't more passionately recommend them. And so what's your final... It's, it's unlike you to choose some food, Arthur. I'm very cheered I to I know, hear. but I am I am becoming very aware of the, the hand-in-glove supermarket yeah. stranglehold. And I mean, both both my parents actually are, are growing growing bits and bobs now. And I've, oh, I've really felt for both of them this year because they both tried to and their seedlings just haven't grown because the compost that's available just isn't growing the seedlings. So... I, I'm really pleased that we've got these seedling collections of veg to send out to people. I'm going to buy my dad, Nick in particular. He's definitely going to get the um, the winter kale collection. Because oh, bless him, he's, he's been bringing me up saying, you know, I've sown my seeds off. They're just not germinating and they're not growing because he's just using compost that isn't isn't of a good mix. So, yeah, I think I think these collections of veg are they're just really lovely to have. And I just want to be able to know I'm eating nice things. Um, more and more so who knows I am starting well when you get more space maybe you yeah will more start. space 
Great. But yeah, the, the fact that you can send out, I think, lovely things for people to grow and eat. And the great thing is, you know, the stuff that we're talking about now is for autumn planting. So you can yeah. get it planted while the soil's still warm. It'll get growing and then you can start harvesting some of it, like the chard and things like that, for Christmas. Yeah. So um, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift, I think, to give people. Lovely. Lovely. Oh, so nice to chat, Arthur. Well done on the catalogue. It's fabulous. Oh, good. Well, it's all online and I hope that there are exciting things for everybody. There certainly are for us. Thanks very much for listening to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange with Arthur Parkinson and I nattering about our favourite bulbs and perennials, etc. for planting in the season coming up for the season after that, so for autumn planting for spring and summer. And actually, next week, I'm back with Arthur again, which is jolly nice. And I thought I would take a bit of time out and just chat to him about what he's been up to. He's taken over this little bit of land in Gloucestershire near where he lives. And he is tending and raising lots of amazing poultry. And he's going to talk about why that's important um, to him and kind of to all of us, really. And also about dahlias. So in this patch, which is rented land, because he's in the situation that lots of young people are, that they can't afford to buy a house. And so they have to rent a house and rent land and or rent a plot or rent a garden. Anyway, and so in it, he has brought along loads of amazing hens and loads of amazing dahlias. So I'm going to talk to him all about that next week. See you then. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.